Oh, what did you have for lunch? Uh, the burrito. Yeah, the burrito as well. What, what did you have in the burrito? Oh, the beef and some guacamole. You know, it was really nice. Stop. Uh, Enough of this cutesy chit chat. It's time to learn tech time. You're not the same person that was here last episode. No. No, uh, you are Baramus. Yes. Is that correct pr pronounce, pronunciation? Well, pronunciation? <laughs> whenever people ask me how do I pronounce your name, it's mostly through chat and I type, it rhymes with Nostradamus. But in the UK, it's Nostradamus. In the US, it's Nostradamus. Oh. And I say Bramus. So it's Bramus, Bramus, or Bramus. Oh, <laughs> so it doesn't have the same number of syllables as Nostradamus. No, no, no. It okay, just, ri it just rhymes with it. Bramus? <laughs> what? No, okay. So it rhymes with Nostradamus. Okay, cool. Uh, and, and you uh, work on the same team as me. Yeah. Technically, there are sub you mentioned you weren't part of our team, but <sighs> you are. <laughs> <laughs> sub teams and sub team. You're Chrome Dev role. So if anyone like you know, because the last few episodes have I've been getting guests from outside Google in. Yes. So if anyone was wondering like how long I'm going to make that last, you know, until I run out of friends, I've had to fall back to just just a colleague. Yeah. Um, hope just a colleague. <laughs> but maybe by the end of this, we might be friends. Yeah. And yeah. Well done. <laughs> you you'll at some point find out what it's like to be friends with me, and you can revisit that. That yeah, yay, maybe I will reconsider. Thing. Yeah, ex exactly. But I want to talk about some magic tricks with the HTML parser. Um, Sounds special already. Magic tricks. I... Oh, it's special. <laughs> it's special. Um, so the browser receives bytes of HTML down the wire, and from this, it constructs a DOM. Uh, we talked about this on the, on the show before, that it can do this in a streaming manner. It doesn't need the whole document before it can show yeah. something uh, to the user, which is like, Super handy uh, when it comes to like long documents and stuff. So, question time. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to change the HTML a bit. Da, 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 da. What changes about the DOM? So we've got the HTML on the left and the resulting DOM on the right. I've got some uh, showing where the white space uh, and new lines are as well. Doesn't it do this trick where it auto closes some tags, but not all, I guess. Mm. So a paragraph might be a good one to auto close, I think, because you can't nest them. So what you're saying in terms of the DOM change? It stays the same. That would be my guess. That is a very good guess, um, and to all intents and purposes, is correct. Uh, it'll do this, whoop, because that white space is now inside the yeah, paragraph. Yeah. But you're right. Yeah, the HTML spec defines like certain tags which just don't have to close, and they'll auto close. And paragraphs are one of them. But, dun, dun 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 what happens now? Now it gets messed up, right? <laughs> <laughs> mm. Does the M continue or not? Hmm. I would guess it all closes it because of the succeeding P there. It would like say, mm, I'm going to close this M. That, that would make sense. Now what happens? Woo! We get uh, an M in both of our paragraphs. <laughs> The spec defines like certain formatting tags, which will carry over. Yeah, uh, yeah, which is great because if you had your HTML like this, uh, you end up with double, double M's. M's. <laughs> and if you just keep on repeating lines like that, you end up with increasingly uh, nested M's as we go along. Nice. Yeah, this is great stuff. Um, so here's a partial HTML document. So this is you know partially parsed. Uh, we get a DOM like this, kind of as you would expect. What about now? I think I know this. Oh. I think it, it switches them because it like sees that like, this ain't correct, so it will switch the P and the M tag to make it correct. Ah, well, nope. It's going to oh. put the paragraph inside the M. But what about now? <laughs> 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 well, I'm guessing that now it will switch them. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much. Here we go. Dun, 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 Yeah, so mm -hmm. it pops the paragraph outside of the M, um, but using a very similar model we saw before, it's going to recreate a new M uh, inside the paragraph, which closes in it. Oh, yeah, so it. that when it sees the P, it will close the M, but it will continue the M down. Well, it's more when it sees the closing 
M tag is when it triggers it to do all of this. It's called the like agency adoption algorithm in the spec. Uh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> usually when I show these kind of examples, um, someone will say, and I think we've had this in the comments in previous episodes, a small should just have a strict mode where it fails hard on errors like it does in CSS and JavaScript. Um, and I want to kind of provide the other side of that argument because there's, uh, there's a, a lot to him. We've you know. tried this, right? XHTML2? Brilliant. Exactly. So let's talk a bit about HTML. So we've got hypertext markup language is what it stands for. Um, originally was based on uh, SGML, standard generalized markup language. Uh, it looks very similar. Uh, it had very slightly different rules, but, but whatever. Uh, this whole thing actually came from IBM. Uh, well, it was a separate spec called generalized markup language, which looks quite different, but mm -hmm. it's where SGML came from. And that was invented in the 60s uh, at IBM. Wow. By these fellas, uh, Charles Goldfrab, Edward Mosher, or Mosher, I'm, I'm not sure on the pronunciation, and Raymond Laurie. Now, oh no, <laughs> this is where the name came from. So like the, the bedrock of our industry, like the markup in HTML, that comes from a backronym from a group of lads' names in the 60s cool. at IBM. <laughs> so you know, how do you feel about that now, you know? Um, but yeah, what you said before, exactly right. We have tried this strict thing before. Uh, this was in the mid to late 90s, uh, into the 2000s. There was an idea of like, let's you know, break away from SGML completely. And let's do this all in XML. Uh, and this was XHTML. And you mentioned uh, XHTML2. Yeah. So this is uh, early 2000s. And this is when they said, right, you need to be parsing this as XML now. That's, that's the rule. Uh, XML doesn't have any error correction. It's like when, when you get to a mistake, poof. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the spec does say, like, we're not going to tell browsers what to display in, in those cases. But you know, there was no real contingency for displaying anything yeah. meaningful. And when browsers, like, this spec went on, along for a bit, and browsers ended up saying, no, actually, we don't want to do that. And I think that was the right thing, because take two browsers, which one is better? The browser that will display the opening times for your local doctor surgery or the browser that displays this. And this is a real example, by the way. I took the HTML from my local doctor surgery, the page which displays the opening times, and I passed it through a strict parser, and, and this is what you get. Wow. But, a, but a normal HTML parser will deliver me the opening times for the doctor's surgery. Yeah, and I think this is worse. <laughs> It definitely is. <laughs> it's, it's worse for the, for the user, right? Like, you could say, well, this is the developer's fault. But if a user can choose a different browser where they get the opening times for their doctor surgery, then that's the browser they're going to choose. Yep. And, and it seems better that they would do that. Um, the other part of this statement, and I've heard it multiple times, like, I want it to you know, fail strictly like CSS and JavaScript. Mm. That's not right. CSS fails wonderfully well. Exactly. <laughs> so here's an example. If you have some CSS like this, this isn't valid CSS at all. And then you carry on. Um, the div will have a background of yellow. The HTML will not have a background of green because it the, the way it yeah. parses it, it kind of that bit invalid bit kind of gets rolled into the next bit. But as you say, the spec says what to do in this situation and how to eventually recover from those error cases. Um, at first, I thought, like, OK, but that is true of JavaScript. But the more I thought about it, like, in this case, that first block is not going to run because it's got a syntax mm -hmm. error, and it does fail immediately. But that second block will run. Yeah, but this is because they're separate blocks, right? So separate contexts and... Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But it's still not as strict as it could be. Um, if we are taking a super strict model, and even like in JavaScript, if you have like a, an event listener which throws an error, we will still fire the event again, you know, uh, or fire, and even run other listeners, even though only one listener like threw an yeah. error. In the browser, JavaScript is quite error resilient. It's not as resilient as like CSS because imperative language, it would be difficult to do anything even close to useful. Yeah, um, I think the difference is that if CSS sees an error, 
it will continue down. Mm -hmm. If JavaScript sees an error, it will stop right there. And it stops that bit of execution. Yeah. Like um, the callback for the event handler, that function will bail out, but the rest will continue. Yeah, it will yeah. bail until the stack is empty. Um, which, But if you run JavaScript on the command line, it, you know, if it encounters an uh, uncaught error, it just bails on the process. So yeah. our super strict model could do the same in the browser. It could just crash the tab, you know? So you could Ooh, say that even yeah. JavaScript is pretty, you know, it's not super strict mode. Yeah. It's quite resilient. It could have been stricter. Right? Yeah. It could have been stricter. The bad news was back in the HTML4 days, there was no spec for what to do with this. Uh, it was just left to the browsers to figure it out. And what happens when you ask browsers to figure it out? They all do. The same thing, right? No, no, the other <laughs> oh. thing. They do something completely different. Um, Internet Explorer uh, at the time, it didn't even store the DOM as a tree. It stored it as a kind of graph because that's what they did in Word at the time. And they thought, well, this is like a formatting model. We'll do the same thing. So in Internet Explorer terms, if you were going to say, like, world, is that inside a paragraph or is it just inside the body? Internet Explorer would say, yes, yes, it is one of those things, depending on how you read the graph. And that's why we ended up with so many bugs in Internet Explorer, because things like the, the DOM APIs, things like CSS, these rely on this tree view mm -hmm. that Internet Explorer just didn't have. It was kind of mapping that backwards from an, an incompatible format. Uh, Opera at the time would store this as a tree, but the CSS would be interpreting it as a different tree. Mozilla, uh, Firefox at the time, they how it would parse this depended on how many chunks were sent to the parser. So if you sent that as one chunk to the parser, it would come up with one answer. If you sent it character by character, it would give you a different answer, which in the oh, real world so meant... So it would evaluate each chunk individually and... So, and where those, so, you know, and in the real world, that depends on like TCP packet boundaries. Yeah. You might get a different tree from this uh, in Firefox Whoa. at the time. Uh, and that left what uh, Safari did, uh, WebKit did at the time, which was this. And so uh, folks went and decided, like, we need to write a specification for this. And they went through all of these weird cases. Well, I say they, it was basically one guy, Ian Hickson, uh, went through all these cases and picked something for all the browsers to do. And that usually meant doing what Internet Explorer did because pages were built for Internet Explorer yeah. back then. Um, there was only cases like this where Internet Explorer's behavior wasn't even consistent with itself, um, that they went looking for another behavior. And that was HTML5. So this is 2006 when the, the parsing part of the spec was, was released. And this is what browsers got behind. And it gave us what we have now, which is a consistent model uh, between all of the browsers for how to handle these errors. But if anyone watching isn't convinced by like, you know, this relaxed model of HTML. Good news. You can put your money where your mouth is and do this. Uh, if you serve your content with uh, application XHTML, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, and you put the XML namespace on your HTML element, that will kick all of the browsers into a strict parsing mode. It will parse it as XML. And off you go. And that means wow. <laughs> if you get anything wrong, um, this is what you get. And this is how I created this example, um, was just taking the HTML from Dr. Surgery and, and putting it into this mode where the browser will fail hard like this, which, which it does. So yeah, go, go do that if you must. But <laughs> it's really users that will, will suffer. Although I, I do wish that our dev tools reported parsing errors, like really serious parsing errors, a bit more than they, than they do now. But uh, I filed an issue about that. We'll see what happens. All right, but we're still kind of left with some of the remnants of XHTML. The closing tag, uh, self-closing, yeah. Do you do this? I still do it, but it's not needed, if I understand correctly. Yeah, I'm, I'm in two minds about whether I like this or not, and I think I'm starting to come to the conclusion that I don't like it. I do it in a lot of my projects because I use Prettier the, the code and, and prettier will add these in and I'm like, whatever, I don't want to have the argument. I'll just I'll just go along with it. Do you do you do the space before? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know also, why? Also with the, with the break, like the BR tag. 
I yeah, also, BR, it's, it's like it's, it's 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 a habit. I do the space. Yeah. Do, do you know Do you know why you, why you're doing that? Uh, it gives you compatibility with Netscape Navigator four. Congratulations. Oh, good. That's so. <laughs> Yeah. So people doing this, like this is giving you compatibility with XML parsers and Netscape Navigator 4. So I think, I don't know, it seems a bit silly to me that we still do this, um, unless you have those requirements. Because the browser sees this uh, in, in the oldie days of HTML4, the slash would be a parsing error, but yeah. it, it would recover. Uh, now in the HTML5 uh, and the new HTML spec, it sees that slash, but it just ignores it, doesn't do anything with it. Uh, so this works. But if you do this, um, again, the slash is ignored. Uh, so your span is now inside your anchor tag. Whoa, OK. Because it, it doesn't, that slash doesn't mean anything. So I, I, this is, I find those trailing slashes a bit misleading. Because unfortunately, developers do have to just remember which tags are self-closing. And that slash doesn't yeah. really do anything, except in foreign content. So we're talking SVG and MathML. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, that trailing slash is meaningful because it's, yeah, that, a different parsing rule kicks in. And, and that sort of thing works. So yeah, unfortunately, a lot for developers to think of, but uh, there's no other way around it. All right, back to quiz time. You ready? <laughs> OK, so we've got a partially parsed document here. Yeah, you can see how it looks. Yeah. What about now? So this is a Ooh. synchronously running script um, that will run uh, as part of parsing immediately as the, the, the script closes. Append and then two. So it's getting the, the H1, and it's appending mm. the thing with class summary, which is the, yeah, that, that div. But it it's isn't not, closed. It's so... not closed. Oh, no. That's oh, the interesting no. bit. Uh, I know. It's difficult, isn't it? <laughs> but I, I, I can see two options. One, it will do it. Or two, it will say, like, hey, you know what? This div class summary, internally, I close it just to make sense. But you can't do anything with it just yet. So hmm. maybe the second behavior, that will be. OK. So what it does is it will it'll do what you asked. Uh, because it, at that point, it does have a node an element in the document with class summary. Yeah. Yes, it's not closed, but there isn't really the concept in the DOM of an unclosed element, uh, not in terms of what JavaScript can see anyway. So our summary element is now in our H1, uh, and our main element is now, well, it's got some white space in. But <laughs> da -da -da, <laughs> where's this going to go? I always like a challenge. <laughs> hmm. I honestly don't know. So what this will do, it will append it to the, the, the summary element. So that, that power OK, so it remembers there. its location, and it will continue there. Exactly. So <laughs> more stuff. what about now? <laughs> so we've now closed the summary element, and we've added another paragraph. What's going to happen? No clue. No clue. So this is going to go in the main element. So it's down there. Here's, wow. here's why this happens. So the parser has a stack of open elements. So right now it's HTML, body, main, and this uh, div class yeah. summary thing. So when this runs, right, fine, it moves the summary element. Cool. And when it sees this paragraph, it's going to insert it into the top item on the stack, which is our summary. So there it goes. The summary tag closes. It gets popped off the stack. Pops off the stack. Yeah. So the next paragraph goes into the main. So when you're moving stuff, if you end up moving stuff around the DOM while it's parsing, that's, that's the model. Like If your JavaScript moves stuff around, it doesn't affect the stack of, of things in the parser. In fact, if you even if you remove the element from the DOM, like the parser will still inject stuff into that mm -hmm. removed element until it gets to the, the previous item in the stack, in which case things will start appearing in the, in the document again. But we can actually use that for something useful, really. So switch things up a little bit. So on the right, we've got a complete DOM, but it's got a script. Uh, and on the left, I'm going to show you what that script does. So GitHub, 
when you navigate around GitHub, you click a link, uh, it does its whole SPA thing, but it's quite a simple SPA model. What it does is it just goes and fetches some HTML and then it dumps that into the document mm -hmm. using a model very similar to this. So you can imagine you create a div, append a div, do some inner HTML with it, and that works uh, as you'd expect. But the problem with GitHub doing this is they lose that whole streaming benefit. Like they, they have to wait until they fetch the whole thing before they dump it yeah. on the page. But we know with things like fetch, you can get the content like a bit at a time as it comes down the network. You can receive it in chunks. I've seen people try to take advantage of this um, by doing something like this. Like they append the div and then do inner HTML hello. Um, and everything's going pretty good so far. Uh, but then when they get the next chunk, they do this. Now, the problem with this is by appending to inner HTML, you're actually asking it to serialize the div's content, mm -hmm. turn it into a string, um, which includes the closing tag in that paragraph, because it, it, it doesn't maintain internally that it's still open when it serializes it. It will give you a, a proper serialization. So when you append world to the end, you end up with this. Like it, you know, it gets the closing tag, appends world, and then it sees that closing tag, and it's like, I don't know where this closing yeah. tag's from. And according to the rules, it will create an empty paragraph uh, when it when it does that. But there is a way to do it properly. Have you ever seen this API before? Um, I hadn't mm. until relatively recently. Well, it rings a bell, but. Yeah, enlighten me. <laughs> yeah, so this so this is you're creating a new HTML document, but just just uh, one in JavaScript land. It's not yeah. displayed to the user. Uh, but what you can do when you've got this is you can call document .write. and you know a lot of people say don't use document .write, It's bad. Like yes, it, it is bad when you're calling it during the parsing of your main document. Mm -hmm. Calling it on this detached document, totally fine. And this is what gives us this access to the parser. And because we're document.writing, we're injecting strings directly into the parser. It has full parser state, so it's like a, a partial parsing right cool. now. So I can take that div and pop it in the document. And now, when I write to that document... It's going to go inside the div. It's going to go inside the div. Yeah. Which is great. So now, as you fetch the content, and now if I append to it, because it's got full parser state, it does understand that that paragraph is still open. It will do the right thing. So nice. you can fetch something iteratively and pipe it into the document. You get that, you can have that SPA thing, but you can be streaming HTML directly into your page using this uh, this little this little hack. That's uh, cool. Isn't that cool? cool? I love this. Yeah. I love this hack. Um, and that's really like all I, all I wanted to get to, but we just had to understand <laughs> loads of stuff about the parser before we got here. Um, if anyone wants to learn more about this sort of stuff, uh, some of the examples that I used have come from this book uh, by Simon Peters, who does like a lot of spec work, understands the parser better than most people in the world, uh, and is an online book. It's great. Uh, it's still in progress, um, but yeah, there's some even weirder examples in there, and, and some like historical data of how we got to uh, where we are now with the HTML parser and how it interacts with script and, and all of that sort of stuff. So yeah, go take a look at that. Um, I'll put all the examples in the description as I normally do. But yeah, you can get access to the streaming HTML parser through JavaScript and speed up your pages. Cool. This was the awkward silence. This is the awkward silence, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope I, I don't really cut well. it too short, the awkward silence. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah, we'll Woo!